Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. The Bureau of Police Research and Development, which is under the Ministry of Home Affairs, has issued a set of guidelines for law enforcement agencies in order to help them detect and identify fake news. This is a specific set of guidelines that has been issued by the BPRD in order to curb the impact of fake news in spreading panic, hatred and communal violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. But before we look at these guidelines, first let us understand what is fake news. See, fake news is any piece of information that has been deliberately falsified, misquoted, misrepresented or taken out of context with malicious intent. For example, genuine facts could be falsified deliberately in order to harm the reputation and image of a popular leader. Or an old video could be doctored and taken out of context deliberately in order to spread propaganda and stereotypes against a particular community. Or an old photo could be edited and photoshopped in order to harm someone's reputation. So such falsification or misrepresentation of actual facts is known as fake news. The objective behind spreading fake news is to spread propaganda, spread misinformation or to cause social unrest in order to extract financial or political benefits. Now the question is, who are the ones spreading fake news? See, fake news could be spread by both state agencies and as well as non-state actors. If you look at state-sponsored fake news, for example, your own government and its intelligence agencies could be spreading fake news and propaganda in order to gain political benefits. Or a hostile government and its intelligence agencies could be spreading fake news and misinformation in order to gain a strategic or tactical advantage over the target countries. So when state actors are involved in spreading fake news, propaganda and misinformation, it is generally referred to as information warfare or psychological warfare. Then fake news could also be spread by non-state actors such as terror outfits in order to cause social unrest and spread communal violence. The same could be done by radical religious organizations as well in order to promote religious propaganda and spread hatred against other communities. This could also be done by a private company in order to ruin the reputation of a rival company. Media outlets as well might resort to spreading fake news in order to increase their TRP ratings and readership. Fake news could also be spread by anti-social elements for financial benefits or to cause unrest and cause nuisance in the society. See, spreading rumors and fake news with malicious intent for the sake of one's personal benefit is as old as the human civilization itself. But with the evolution of mass media, there has been an exponential increase in the reach and impact of fake news. In the 19th century and the earlier parts of 20th century, print media such as newspapers and magazines and radio were the preferred platforms for spreading fake news and misinformation. Then with the introduction of electronic media, that is television, especially 24-7 news channels, fake news found a more convenient platform. But the menace of fake news acquired alarming proportions with the advent of social media. With the advent of mobile communication and internet, fake news has acquired a new dimension. As mobile phones and internet became cheaper and as their reach increased across the world, we saw the evolution of social media platforms such as Facebook, WhatsApp, etc. So over the last one decade, these platforms have become the preferred medium for spreading fake news. And the threat posed by fake news to peace and stability in a society and to a country's internal security has increased exponentially with the advent of social media because these platforms have provided unprecedented reach to fake news and they have exponentially magnified the real world impact of fake news. Now let us look at a few fake news incidents that have affected the social stability and internal security of India. In 2012, there was a fake text message that went viral in southern parts of India, which alleged that Muslims in South Indian cities would be attacking northeastern migrant workers who are residing and working in South Indian cities. This fake message was motivated by a communal riot that had occurred in Assam. And this fake message had a real world impact and it led to the overnight exodus of northeastern people from South Indian cities. Then over the last couple of years, 
a fake WhatsApp message has been doing the rounds that refers to a child lifting gang involved in kidnapping and murdering children. This fake message has spread across India and it has led to numerous incidents where people or the natives of rural areas and tribal areas have taken law into their own hands and they have lynched any suspicious looking person. According to various reports, more than 100 people have been lynched and killed in this manner as a result of this fake WhatsApp message across India. Now during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen that a few fake videos and doctored videos have been doing the rounds, which have been trying to target the entire Muslim community, especially Muslim fruit vendors, by exploiting the negative sentiments surrounding the Tablighi Jamat event. Then we also have a fake message that has been doing the rounds, which is looking to scam people in the name of receiving donations to a fake PM Cares Fund. So this real-world impact of fake messages makes it a social threat and as well as an internal security threat. So in order to curb the spread of such fake news items during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Bureau of Police Research and Development has come out with a specific set of guidelines in order to help the law enforcement agencies across the country to identify and detect such fake news items. The BPRD has pointed out that the spread of such fake news will further spread panic in the society, create hatred between communities and lead to communal polarization. In these guidelines, the BPRD has flagged a few digital news platforms which have been deliberately spreading fake news and misinformation in order to increase their TRP ratings and readership. See, with the evolution in technology, it is not just facts, photos, articles, videos and audios that are being doctored, but we are also witnessing the creation of an entirely fake video using artificial intelligence and machine learning known as deep fakes or deep fake videos. These deep fake videos appear to be so authentic that it is almost impossible to distinguish them and identify them. So the BPRD has come out with the following set of guidelines in order to help law enforcement agencies detect and identify fake news items. In these guidelines, the BPRD has given highest priority to verification and authentication of every suspected information. These guidelines call upon the law enforcement agencies to cross-check any suspicious article, information, pictures, audio files, etc. with trusted sources such as the Press Information Bureau, trusted media outlets such as the Hindu itself, or fact-checking platforms such as reporterlabs.org or the Trusted News Initiative. We have discussed in a previous session the Trusted News Initiative was launched by BBC in association with other trusted media outlets from around the world, including the Hindu from India. Apart from cross-checking the facts and the information with trusted sources, the guidelines call upon the law enforcement agencies to verify the credentials of the author. A basic background check should help the law enforcement agencies to establish the credentials of the author. Then the guidelines also ask the law enforcement agencies to rely upon simple techniques such as carrying out a Google reverse image search in order to verify the authenticity of an image and also to look for obvious clues in fake articles such as incorrect language, grammatical mistakes, etc. Because research has shown that most fake news articles have authors with questionable credentials and these articles also contain a lot of spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes. So by using these guidelines, the BPRD is calling upon the law enforcement agencies to quickly identify and detect fake news items and to pursue legal action against these elements under various provisions of the law. Now let's take up an article from page number 8 which deals with the border dispute between India and Nepal. See, yesterday we spoke about the inauguration of a new link road by the Indian government that passes through the Kalapani region and Lipu Lake Pass on the Indo-Nepal border in order to create a shorter and faster route to the Kailash Manas Sarovar Yatra in China. As soon as the project was inaugurated by the Indian side, the government of Nepal has raised an objection to it because according to the Nepali government, India has breached a commitment that it had made under a 2014 agreement. So this development gives us an opportunity to look at the border dispute between India and Nepal in detail. See, India and Nepal have border disputes at two locations, one at Kalapani and second at Susta. See, the Kalapani border dispute is centered over here 
on the borders between Uttarakhand and Nepal. This border dispute traces back its origin to the Treaty of Sugoli, which was signed in 1816 between the British East India Company and the Kingdom of Nepal, that was the Gorkha Kingdom. This treaty was signed at the end of the Anglo-Nepalese War and as per this treaty, the Kali River was identified as the boundary between British India and Nepal. The Kali River, which originates in the Himalayas, is also known as the Sharda River or the Mahakali River and it has a number of tributaries in the upper reaches. So Nepal has claimed that a tributary of the Kali River, which lies to the west of Kalapani, marks the boundary and hence it claims the entire Kalapani region as a part of its territory. Whereas India claims that a tributary of the Kali River that lies to the east of Kalapani as the western boundary of Nepal and hence India claims that Kalapani belongs to Indian territory. But this disputed territory is currently under Indian administration and it is a part of the Pithorgad district in Uttarakhand. So Kalapani, the Kali River and the strategic Lipu Lake Pass lie on the route to Kailash Manasarovar Yatra and hence India claims that the strategic Lipu Lake Pass is located at the tri-junction of India, Nepal and China. But Nepal has always rejected this claim of India and it says that the Lipu Lake Pass is located on the border between Nepal and China only because the Kalapani region belongs to Nepal. So this border dispute has not been settled between the two countries over the years and hence it continues to remain a standing border dispute. But now that the Border Roads Organization of India has constructed a road between Darchula and the Lipu Lake Pass in order to create a shorter and faster route to the Kailash Manasarovar Yatra, Nepal has raised an objection against this project. And also remember that the Kalapani region and the Lipu Lake Pass are strategically important for India because India has a very strong military presence in the region that faces the Chinese forces that are deployed at the border. In fact, both India and China have even set up a trading point at Kalapani that is near the Lipu Lake Pass and both the countries have even established a border personnel meeting point in order to resolve any local border disputes. But Nepal has been consistently objecting to this Indian presence and in 2014, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had assured his Nepali counterpart that this border dispute would be resolved through mutual negotiations. Over the last 70 odd years, this border dispute never flared up between India and Nepal because of cordial relations between both the countries. But in January 2020, the Indian government published a new political map of India which took into account the reorganization of Jammu and Kashmir. Basically, this new map was showing the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and the Union Territory of Ladakh. In this new political map, India included Kalapani and as well as Susta as a part of Indian Territory and this was immediately objected by the government of Nepal. Now, within three months of publication of this map, India has inaugurated a road that passes through the Kalapani region and the Lipu Lake Pass in order to facilitate the Kailash Manasarovar Yatra and hence the Nepali government has again expressed its objection and it has reiterated that Kalapani belongs to Nepal as per the terms laid out under the Treaty of Sugoli. But in response to these claims of Nepal, India's Ministry of External Affairs has replied and it has stated that Kalapani belongs to Indian territory and it has clearly rejected Nepal's claims. So this standoff between India and Nepal over the Kalapani border dispute, which has been acquiring significance over the last few months, threatens to derail the close relationship between India and Nepal. Now let us quickly talk about the Susta border dispute as well. See, Susta is a border village located in the Lumbini zone of the India-Nepal border. This border dispute also traces its origin to the Treaty of Sugoli which was signed in 1816. As per this treaty, the Gandak River, which is also known as Sapta Gandaki and Narayani in Nepal, that originates in the Nubain Himal glacier of Nepal was identified as the international boundary between the borders of Nepal and Bihar. See the Narayani river which flows in Nepal enters into India near the Valmiki tiger reserve which is located in Bihar and then it is known as the Gandak river and it goes on to join the Ganga river at Patna. As per the treaty of Sugoli, the right bank of the Gandak river 
was to be considered as Nepal's territory and the left bank of the Gandak river was to be considered as Indian territory. So when the treaty was signed in 1816, Susta was located on the right bank of the Gandak and hence it was a part of Nepal's territory. But over the years, river Gandak has changed its course and as a result, Susta has moved to the left bank of the river. So this makes Susta a part of Indian territory. So as a result of this unclear demarcation, the Susta border dispute continues to be a standing dispute between India and Nepal. Now let's take up an article from page number 10. According to this article, India currently has a great opportunity to emerge as a major exporter of masks. See, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and increased awareness about the usage of masks, there has been an exponential rise in global demand for masks, especially in Western countries such as European countries and the United States. Currently, this huge demand for masks in the Western countries is being met by key suppliers such as China, Thailand, Vietnam and Indonesia in Southeast Asia and as well as by Latin American countries such as Brazil and Argentina. But as a result of the exponential increase in demand, the production capacity of these supplier countries has been completely overwhelmed and even China, which is the world's largest producer of masks, has been able to meet only 50% of the global demand. So the textile and biotech industry of India believes that this creates a tremendous opportunity for India to emerge as the second largest producer of masks right behind China and establish itself as a cheaper alternative and a more reliable alternative for Chinese masks. Industry experts believe that India currently has the required skills, the required capacity and resources to match this global demand. But the current ban on the export of masks and personal protection equipment that has been placed by the Indian government is restricting this opportunity. But the Indian industry is hoping that the ban on the export of masks would be lifted by the Indian government very soon, as soon as the lockdown restrictions are relaxed. So in anticipation of this opportunity, the Indian industry has started to gear up for the challenges. This includes the need to maintain the highest quality standards, the need to meet the requirements of Western customers, and the need to innovate with regard to the design of masks by providing water repellent and antibacterial coatings. Now let's take up an article from page number 11. According to this article, the Sal forest tortoise, or also known as the elongated tortoise, is facing an increased threat to its survival. This tortoise species is found in the Indian subcontinent and as well as in few parts of Southeast Asia. Within the Indian subcontinent, we can come across the Sal forest tortoise in India, parts of Nepal, parts of Bhutan and as well as in Bangladesh. Within India, its habitat stretches from the northern to eastern parts of India, ranging from Uttarakhand to the northeast of India. This tortoise species has been listed as critically endangered by the IUCN because of the increased threat to its survival. The biggest threat faced by the Sal forest tortoise is hunting and poaching. This tortoise is mainly hunted for food, especially in northeastern parts of India and in Southeast Asia. And its shell is also used as a decorative mask. So the Sal forest tortoise that is hunted is frequently trafficked as a part of international wildlife trade. This highlights the threats being faced by turtles and tortoises in India. And according to a recent study conducted by the Wildlife Institute of India, 23 out of the 29 freshwater turtles and tortoises that are found in India, they fall under the threatened category of the IUCN, which includes critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. This study has shown that 80% of the species population has declined over the last 90 years. According to the study, there are two major concerns for the survival of the species. One of course is hunting and poaching and the other threat is that the natural habitat of this tortoise stretches across protected areas and it overlaps into unprotected areas. So since a large part of the habitat of this tortoise is not falling under protected areas, it becomes all the more vulnerable to hunting and poaching and it also becomes vulnerable to the jump fire that is lit as a part of shifting cultivation that is widely practiced in northeastern parts of India. The burning down of cropping areas and the clearing of forest areas increases the risk of forest fires 
and this directly threatens the survival of the tortoise. And the fire also clears up the forest cover, thus exposing the tortoise and making it vulnerable to hunting and poaching. So in this context, the study conducted by the Wildlife Institute of India has pointed out that even reptiles and amphibians such as turtles and tortoises should receive the same attention and priority as that of bigger mammals such as tigers and elephants as far as conservation efforts are concerned. See, if you look at our protected areas such as wildlife sanctuaries, tiger reserves and national parks, they are all mammal centric, especially bigger mammals such as tigers, elephants, rhinoceros, etc. And also, if you look at the conservation of transboundary species and transboundary cooperation between countries in the region, the conservation strategy is always focused on the bigger mammals. So the current strategy being followed in our protected areas and with regard to transboundary cooperation tends to ignore other threatened species such as reptiles and amphibians. For example, if you look at the protected area at Manas, there is joint cooperation between India and Bhutan with regard to conservation of rhinoceros, tigers, elephants, etc. But the reptiles and amphibians are completely ignored. The same applies for the protected area at Sundarbans, where India and Bangladesh cooperate to conserve the tigers, but not the other species. So experts at the Wildlife Institute of India have said that even threatened reptiles and amphibians, such as the brackish water turtle, or also known as the Batgur Baska, or the Northern River Terrapin, which is distributed across India and Bangladesh and listed as critically endangered, should receive the same attention and priority as that of bigger mammals, such as tigers and elephants. Now let's take up an article from page number 12, which evaluates the PM Cares Fund that was established by Prime Minister Modi on the 28th of March in order to sponsor the efforts of the Government of India against the COVID-19 pandemic. See, the PM Cares Fund has been set up as a charitable trust and it can receive voluntary contributions from both individuals and organizations, including public and as well as private organizations. The PM Cares Fund does not receive any budgetary support. That means it does not receive any budgetary allocation from the government and it relies entirely upon voluntary contributions being made by individuals and organizations. The government has also said that contributions made to the PM Cares Fund qualifies for CSR obligations for organizations and the contributions have also been exempted from the Foreigner Contribution Regulation Act of 2010, which means that the fund can receive foreign contributions as well. So a foreign based private organization or private individuals or even a public organization can make voluntary contributions to the PM Cares Fund. This exemption granted under the Foreigner Contribution Regulation Act has triggered a controversy because just a couple of years ago, when Kerala witnessed massive floods in 2018 and 19, the central government had refused to receive any foreign aid by citing the provisions of the Disaster Management Act, which empowers the centre with discretionary powers to decide upon accepting foreign aid and donations for dealing with disasters and calamities. Then if you look at how the fund is managed, it is managed by a trust where the Prime Minister of India is acting as the chairperson he is assisted by three ex-officio trustees of the fund, which includes the Minister of Defence, the Minister of Home Affairs and the Minister of Finance. And the Prime Minister also gets to nominate three eminent persons to the board of trustees that manages the PM Cares Fund. After Prime Minister Modi announced the establishment of the PM Cares Fund, it generated a controversy and drew attention to another fund that is already under the Prime Minister which is the Prime Minister's National Relief Fund or PMNRF. See, this fund was established in 1948 by then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru in order to sponsor the relief efforts of the Government of India for partitioned refugees who were coming in from Pakistan. Later, the terms of PMNRF have been amended and right now, these funds can be used to assist victims of natural and industrial disasters, riots, accidents, acid attack, etc. If you look at how the PMNRF is administered, earlier we had a committee which was under the Prime Minister and it also included the Deputy Prime Minister, the Finance Minister and it also provided a seat for the President of the Congress Party, a representative of Tata Trustees and a representative from the industry. But in 1985, this committee entrusted the management of this fund 
to the sole discretion of the prime minister and currently the pmnrf is being administered through the prime minister's office itself according to available data the prime minister's national relief fund already has accumulated around 3800 crores which is lying idle and this has led to questions from opposition parties and critics as to why the prime minister chose to establish a new fund instead of making use of the already available funds under the prime minister's national relief fund apart from this opposition parties and experts have raised a number of other concerns as well with regard to the pm cares fund their first concern is that the establishment of a separate fund under the prime minister might affect the flow of relief funds to similar funds that exist under the chief ministers of state governments so according to them this might hamper the relief efforts that are being organized by the state governments apart from this there is still no clarity whether the pm cares fund falls under the ambit of the rti act and the comptroller and auditor general for the time being the government has clarified that the pm cares fund would be audited by independent auditors and not the cag so this has led to questions over the opaqueness of the fund with regard to the identity of the donors and the manner in which the money would be spent now let's take up an article from page number 12 See, it is well known that migrant workers and interstate workers have gone through immense suffering as a result of the lockdown. We have all heard of unfortunate stories of migrant workers struggling for food and shelter and walking thousands of kilometers and losing their lives in the process. In the context of this grave crisis being faced by the migrant workers and the interstate workers, the article tries to evaluate the protection that is offered to migrant workers and interstate workers under the interstate migrant workmen act of 1979 it tries to compare these provisions with the provisions that have been proposed under the occupational safety health and working conditions code that was introduced in the parliament in 2019 see this proposed code seeks to subsume 13 labor laws and it seeks to simplify the labor laws and introduce labor reforms and one of the laws that is being subsumed under the occupational safety health and working conditions code is the interstate migrant workmen act of 1979 see the 1979 act regulates the employment of interstate migrant workers and their conditions of service these regulatory provisions are applicable to every industry which employs at least 5 or more than 5 migrant workers these provisions have been made applicable not only to the employers but also to the contractors who employ migrant workers and under the 1979 act industries can employ migrant workers only if they register with the government and obtain the required licenses this registration and licensing mechanism has helped in formalizing the welfare of migrant workers and interstate workers because when the employment of migrant workers is regulated through a system of registration and licensing it will help the government to ensure that migrant workers receive adequate wages they are given adequate safe conditions to work in etc now if you look at the proposed code it defines migrant workers as a part of contract labor the parliamentary standing committee which is examining this proposed bill has expressed concern that migrant and interstate workers have not been defined separately under a separate chapter and instead they have been clubbed under contract labor itself So the concern that has been expressed by the parliamentary standing committee and as well as by few experts is that this change in definition might have an impact on the welfare of migrant workers and interstate workers. But on the positive side the proposed bill also provides for a system of registration and licensing. This again helps in strengthening the formalization of welfare of migrant workers and in fact it expands the scope of welfare for migrant workers. The new law not only provides for registration and licensing of these establishments but it also mandates the working hours the minimum wages the basic facilities etc and more importantly it provides for a displacement allowance and a journey allowance to migrant workers in case of closure of industries so the proposed new law definitely has a set of advantages but there are a few concerns that have been flagged by the parliamentary standing committee the column also highlights the concerns that have been expressed by trade unions with regard to the possibility of having a single unified law in the place of a separate law that provides protection for migrant workers and interstate workers and ensures their welfare trade unions are worried 
that having a unified law might affect the welfare of these workers. Trade unions believe that having a separate legislation will better secure the rights of these workers. But however, please note, the article fails to highlight the concerns and the viewpoint of the industry and the government. Because like I said, the proposed law definitely has a number of progressive provisions and it will definitely help in introducing much needed labor reforms into the Indian industry. Now let's take up the practice questions. Which of the following statements are correct? A monopoly is a group of producers of a good or service coming together in order to regulate supply and fix prices. The second statement says a cartel refers to a single group or company whose product offerings completely dominate a sector or industry. It describes an entity that has total or near total control of a market. See both the statements are incorrect because the definitions have been interchanged. So the correct answer is option D, neither one nor two. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 10, the Confederation of Real Estate Developers known as Kredai has expressed concerns to the government of India that cement and steel producers might be forming a cartel to deliberately hike prices in order to realize more profits after the lockdown is relaxed. Now let's take up the next practice question. V Day or V Day or also known as Victory in Europe Day that is celebrated across Europe marks the unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany marking the end of World War II in Europe. Option C is the right answer. Victory in Europe Day or VE Day is celebrated on the 8th of May in West European countries such as United Kingdom, France, Germany etc. Whereas Russia and a few East European countries they celebrate V Day on the 9th of May. This celebration marks the unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany and the defeat of Nazi Germany which brought the Second World War in Europe to an end. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 9, Victory Day celebrations in Russia has been affected as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? The Anglo-Nepalese War, also known as the Gorkha War, was fought between the Kingdom of Gorkha and the British East India Company. The second statement, the East India Company was supported by the Garhwal Kingdom, Patiala State and Kingdom of Sikkim in its fight against the Gorkha Kingdom. The major cause for the conflict was the refusal of the Gorkha Kingdom to allow the East India Company to trade with Tibet via Nepal and the expansionist tendencies of both. All the three statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2017 prelims paper. Who among the following was or were associated with the introduction of Raitwari settlement in India during the British rule? Was it Lord Cornwallis or Alexander Reed or Thomas Munro? The correct answer is option C, 2 and 3 only. Both Alexander Reed and Thomas Munro were associated with the Raitwari settlement. This system of taxation was jointly developed by Alexander Reed and Thomas Munro. It was later implemented by Thomas Munro when he became the governor of Madras province. Under the Raitwari settlement system, the British government would directly interact with the farmers and collect taxes directly from them based on the assessment of the land that was being farmed by the farmers. So the correct answer is option C, 2 and 3 only. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, the rising menace of fake news poses a grave threat to the country's internal security. In this context, evaluate the recent guidelines issued by the Bureau of Police Research and Development for law enforcement agencies. The second question, the Kalapani border dispute between India and Nepal has the potential to derail the close and strategic ties between the two countries. Discuss. So kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.